we're still coming. Okay, for a few moments. Uh, just a quick check. You are in APIs exposed. Make sure that is the talk you want. Um, I know there's a few other um, talks going on here, but this one is the good one. So you've chosen well if this is where you want to be. Uh, this is going to be an introduction. So if you are super amazing at API security, you may find that you know everything. Um, please feel free to depart now if that is the case. Uh, if not, we will just begin. Okay, uh, so this is going to be an encounter with HTTP API security uh, and how it can all go wrong, hopefully not too depressing and doom and gloom. Um, about me, my name is Leila Porter. Uh, I am a C-sharp web developer. Um, I am the organizer of MK.net, that's the Milton Keynes .NET user group, um, which is pretty awesome. We had Scott Hanselman yesterday, so boohoo if you missed that, but that was pretty good. Um, I'm also a developer evangelist for a company called Twilio. Can I get a show of hands who's heard of Twilio? Oh, not nearly enough. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what Twilio is, it is a cloud communications API, and we enable you to integrate everything from voice, video, SMS, text, chat, Facebook, WhatsApp, security, you name it, or email. As of today, secretly, we've got SendGrid, so you now you can do email, and you can bring that all into your applications using the languages you're already using, um, and that is enough about Twilio. You are here to learn more about HTTP API security. So what do I mean by that? That is publicly exposed endpoints that someone can come into and get some information, usually XML, JSON, it goes back out, you give them what they want. It's usually dished up by an HTTP-based web server. Um, and that, that's what we're going to be talking about, how to secure that. So let's just have a little look at what that means a little bit more. So this is your server, <coughs> where your logic, your data, everything, all, all the meat and bones of your application lives in there. And then we're going to stick an API on front. So if you're in uh, .NET C Sharp, that's going to be like your web API, your controllers. We're going to have that, and that will be publicly exposed. Now, you may dish that up directly to your clients by some form or other, um, or you may sell that to a third party, and they will dish it up. Either way, you're going out into the public, and you're exposing these endpoints, your API, to all manner of things. So that may not be the only way you do it. You may have this type of architecture. So you've got databases, maybe other APIs. This could be microservices. It could just be a whole host of things that you're all bringing in under one API. Maybe this is other products from internal teams, and you're just going to expose it via one endpoint. The same thing, you've still got an end user coming in to have a look at that. It is exposed to the public. So this being exposed to the public means that it is open to common attack vectors, and that's what we're going to have a look at. So you will get attacked, hopefully not too badly. So what can we do to do that? But the first thing I want to just have a look at is the OWASP top 10 application security risks. Uh, this isn't just for APIs. This is for all sorts of uh, security risks. So I suggest you have a little look through there. Make sure that you're not exposing yourselves um, to any of these risks listed on there. Um, so it's a really interesting read if you're interested in security, obviously. Um, but I really want to talk about the biggest security risk that we all have to deal with, and that is us humans. Okay. So social engineering uh, is something that happens quite often, um, not always in tech, but as developers, we need to be thinking about what could be happening. So I'm going to share a little story with you. Some of you may have already heard this. Um, and this is about Naoki Hiroshima. And he had the Twitter handle 
at n. So it's a pretty impressive, unique, rare Twitter handle, just at n. So he was always getting password resets in his email box or text messages through, trying to reset his password. So he got to ignoring them. He's even been offered $50,000 for this handle. So one morning, he's sitting there at breakfast, and he gets an email or a notification from PayPal saying, hey, someone's just tried to reset your password. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's normal. So he ignored it. So later, he went to his email. And the very final message he got was that you were receiving this email because your account settings were modified. And he's like, oh, whoops, someone has obviously got through. So he then contacted GoDaddy and gave them the last six digits of his credit card. And they said, no, sorry, that's not the credit card we have on record for you. So he was effectively locked out completely of his GoDaddy account because they'd already gotten in, changed everything, and locked him out. And he was like, what, what's going on here? And then he started to think, is this about my Twitter handle? He also found that his PayPal account was um, compromised, as was his Facebook account. And he then got an email through Facebook from the hackers saying, yeah, you're right. It is about your Twitter handle. And uh, if you don't give it to us, we're going to completely destroy your business. Now, how they were going to do that is that he had all his domains registered on his GoDaddy account. So all of his business, all of his clients' servers, all on his GoDaddy account. So they had the keys to everything. So they were extorting him. So he spoke to a few people, and they said, you kind of got nothing, no other option. You have to hand over your Twitter handle. So this is what he did. And they gave him an email and said, yep, thanks, here's your GoDaddy account, but do you want to know how we did it? Who wouldn't want to know how they were completely hacked? So what happened was that they contacted PayPal as a um, posing as an em uh, employee of PayPal, and they managed to get the last four digits of the credit card. So if you remember, when he went to GoDaddy, he was asked for six digits. He may think, that's all right, they've only got the last four digits. GoDaddy let them guess digits one and two of the credit card. So they guessed one and two. They had three, four, five, six, and they were able to get access to the account completely. So this is really brute forcing the human. So that's kind of depressing. All your faces look very, very down by that. But it's OK. We can try and prevent this type of thing. So let's go on and have a look at brute force attacks. OK. So a brute force attack is where they, a hacker will repeatedly try with multiple passwords, passphrases, to gain access to your account until they get in. There is an alternative, which is the reverse brute force attack, whereas they will have like one password and they will try it across multiple usernames and they'll keep trying that until they get through to one of them. So that's the opposite <coughs> way of doing it. Either way, it, it's still brute force. So how can we prevent brute force attacks? The very first one, account lockout. I'm sure you have all experienced this. I know I have. Where you try three times with your password, and then after that, you're locked out of your account. This happens with my bank, and then I have to phone them up, and then I have to say, yes, it's really me. Can you unlock my account? So this is quite, quite secure, you might be thinking. But going back to that brute force, the reverse brute force, where we're trying one password across hundreds or thousands of usernames, what happens if they keep trying three? You've effectively given a denial of service to so many of your users by just using this method. So what originally feels like a really secure method could be really jeopardizing the trust your clients have in you. So that goes on to progressive delays. Now, I haven't actually experienced a progressive delay on any of the websites I've used. So what this is is the first time you give an incorrect password, you're locked out for, say, a minute. The second time, 
five minutes, the third time, an hour, and then maybe you're locked out. So has anyone experienced that on a, a website? Uh, like six, seven people? Not many, okay? I, I haven't. So this is good if you have a whole network of um, attacks, so it will hit it. And usually when they do a brute force attack, they'll do it really quickly. So it can't do it this because it's effectively locked for 30 seconds or so, so they can't try the password again. So this is really good for preventing automated attacks, but this is a little harder to implement. So there is that technical um, added time of implementing this type of solution into your application. Challenge response. Checking that you're not uh, an automated response. Now, I reckon you have all done a challenge response, the Google recapture, helping Google program their image recognition AI. Yay! But it is really good for making sure that you're human. So in this instance, you would go and click on all of those, um, these ones here, and I think those two. I'm always confused by that. Do I select those two? They do have a sign in them, so I usually select them. And I'm usually verified as human. So this is really good to check if you're human. Um, I know they can be a pain, but they are a, a good added bit of security. So the last one is two-factor authentication or maybe multi-factor authentication. So how this works is on something you have and something you know. So you know a password and you have a telephone, for example. So if we come into here, you might have seen Authy, Twilio product. Um, or you might have used Google Authenticator. So that is a time-based, one-time password. So you'll go in there. You've only got 30 seconds where you have this password. And then you'll enter that into your application after you've given it your usual password. So the usual password is the something you know. And your phone with this app is something you have. Alternatively, a company may give you a device. This is my NatWest bank login thingy majig card reader. Um, I put my credit card or my debit card into this. I enter my PIN, which is something I know, and this is something I have, as is my card. It gives me um, an algorithm, well, it has an algorithm that I have to enter a code, and it spits back out a code which I put into the web application. So again, that is two things I know and have. So this is becoming more and more popular, and you'll see more and more websites asking you to implement 2FA. So I, I would recommend doing that. OK, so DDoS. This is a distributed denial of service attack. So you may have heard those nasty botnets all attacking a website and then denying your users access to your website. So they'll get a spinning disk or, hey, something's wrong with the website right now. Um, this actually happened to me last week. Not, not my site was DDoSed. But I went to the British Airways site. They had a sale going on from 12 PM every day. So I was like, yes, I'm going to get a flight to America for $100. Logged on at 12 PM. And their whole site went down. So they basically enabled a DDoS attack from their users onto themselves. Because we all, everyone who wanted a $100 flight, all flooded the British Airways flight, and their, their sites went down. OK, so companies do it to themselves, but we're talking about malicious attacks here. It happened to Stack Overflow, I think, in 2012, maybe 2011, 2012. It was a good few years ago that they had uh, a DDoS attack. So just as a, a point on that, you'll see that I've got like a little IP-based web camera router. It's not always hacked like phones and viruses that did. It's usually these uh, internet connected devices, these small devices like IP cameras that you have everywhere. Anything that is connected to the internet and can run code is vulnerable. And generally, the security on these types of devices is really low. So they're a prime candidate to be hacked. So that's something to bear in mind if you're ever working on IoT devices as well. 
So how do we stop that? There is nothing of sorts that you can actually do to prevent a DDoS attack. It's all about how you react. So the first thing is scalability, something that British Airways didn't do. They didn't scale the instances of their applications to meet demand, so that's how they DDoS themselves. But scalability is a really good way of keeping your users able to use your site, that you've got more and more instance to enable to handle the demand on your site. However, if you scale, every instance costs you. So if you just keep scaling and you don't catch this, you could have, I don't know, thousands of instances of your application on your cloud server, and that's going to cost you. It's not free. So that is something to bear in mind, that scalability needs to go with traffic monitoring. Traffic monitoring really means knowing what your regular traffic is, or else how can you see when it's changed? So you may be looking, oh, look, there's a massive peak at 12 p.m. on the British Airways site. Oh, yes, we have a sale on. Or at another time, why is there so much traffic now? And that can indicate a DDoS attack. Might not be. Might just be like someone tweeted about it, and everyone's going to have a look. But it's a good indicator. So a good way um, of preventing this is just your cloud, if you are cloud hosting, um, most cloud services providers will have built in, you know, included things that help you monitor, monitor your traffic or scale your applications to meet demand. And so that can be a really useful tool for uh, preventing DDoS, just there, out the box. If you need something more, because you really want to ensure that you're, you're maintaining trust with your clients, you may want to go for a cloud mitigation provider. This is premium, so you will have to pay for them to monitor your traffic, scale, analyze it, tell you, message you, notify you, and all that. But if trust is key with your clients, then this, this could really be a good one for you. something you can do in your applications, and that's rate limiting and API throttling. These are usually bundled together, but there are slight differences. API limiting is the rate at which someone can consume your API. So they can consume maybe 10, they can hit your API 10 times per minute, or say let's an hour, and they can keep doing that every hour. But once they've had those 10 uh, hits in their hour, they have to wait till the next time period. API throttling is a little different. If you just have throttling, you can say this user can have 100 hits per day, and they can use those in like five seconds, or they can use them over the spread of the day. It doesn't matter. They're just limited to how many hits in a given time frame. So I'm actually going to demo this and show you how easy it is to get into a .NET Core application. I'll, I'll tell you about getting it into a, um, a framework application as well. But OK, so we're going to come over here. So I just got downloaded a .NET new uh, web API product project in uh, the CLI. I've adapted it a little bit. Um, and this is just going to return value one, value two. There's nothing else in this at the moment. This isn't limited or throttled. So if I use uh, Postman, is, is everyone familiar with Postman? Yeah, perfect. So um, I don't know how to zoom in on Postman, but that's the, the API endpoint up there, already ready. And I can hit that. And you can see it brings back value one, value two. So how am I going to do that? Keep, keep Clicking this, that's not very effective. So if you come up here, there's something called runner, just in the top left-hand corner. I've already got that open here. And this allows you to run whole collections of, of hits on an API endpoint. So I've already got this endpoint programmed in here. You can see there it is. Um, and you can say how many times you want Postman to hit your API. So I've popped in 25 here. Um, and then we can run it. 
So it brings up this screen. If I scroll down through this, we should see 200 OK for all 25 hits. So it's a really cool tool. So if we actually want to, let's say, throttle our application, if we come back over here, I'll just stop it. Um, so I'm going to use a, a NuGet package by Stefan Proden, uh, ASP.NET Core Rate Limit. So I've already got it included. It's just here. And then if we come over, go away, come over to the startup. In the configuration, I need to just enable that. So if I go there, app.useIPRateLimiting and save that. Now this is going to go and have a look at the app settings. So if we go over to the app settings, this is just copied straight over from the documentation. The documentation is really good. Um, I've got the link at the end, so don't worry. Uh, there's a whole load of different settings. This is just the straight settings out of the, the documentation I've got. So this is the, the important bit that we're interested, general rules. So in here, I've got my endpoint, and in a period of 30 seconds, I want to limit the user to 20 hits. So that's all there. Let's just make sure that's all saved, and then we'll go back and run it. And then we'll go back to the runner over here. So if you go back in collection runner, I'm going to hit that 25 times. So if you remember, I set that to limit 20 times in 30 seconds. So let's run that. So we should have 2200 OKs. And when we get down to number 21, we're getting 49 too many requests. So that's good. If I retry that, I'm expecting all to be 49s. Yeah, if we wait for the 30 seconds to be up, I don't know how 30 seconds can seem quite, quite a long time. Yeah. Oh, that's what it feels like when I'm doing a plank at the gym forever. There we go. So there's 30 seconds gone. So we're back on 200 OK, and we'll be stuck not being able to hit that again for another 30 seconds. Cool. So if we come back, I'm going to stop that again. Let's see if we can uh, limit that. So this is the, the throttling. So what I'm going to do is just copy this. And I'm going to pop it at up here. OK, so let's say in five seconds, I only want them to have five. So they can have five every five seconds. Now, you could do that without the second one, and they could have five every five seconds onwards. But this is going to mean that they can have a total of 20 rate limited to five every second. Okay, so that's all saved. If we come back in here, run that again, and we'll go back over into the runner. So let's just have a look here. We've got 25 iterations, and we'll run that. So you can see there, the first five have gone through. Then we've got 429. So hopefully that's five seconds. We can hit it again, 200, hit it again. And I must have done that one too soon. There we go. And we should be able to get one more if that's, no, too soon. And then hopefully we're within that 30 second time frame and we've got that 49. So we'll have to wait now for 30 seconds to have gone past and then we'll get our other batch for the actual throttle. Cool. So that is something that you can easily put in your application if it's .NET Core because you can have this new Git package. Now, if you are not using .NET Core and you're on a framework, it's a little bit more in-depth, but there is lots of uh, documentation out on the um, internet with it. And that will be, um, you have to make an annotation. And in your annotation, you put your annotation on your endpoint. And I've lost my mouse, there we go. Uh, you put your annotation onto your endpoint, and then when your, it comes in and hits your endpoint, it goes into the annotation, and that's where you can do all your rate limiting. So it, it's a similar idea. You just have to implement it yourself a little bit more. But it works in exactly the same principle. Cool. 
So, where's my clicker? Right. So, moving on to our next potential threat, which is XSS, or cross-site scripting. There are two types. Uh, there is stored, uh, which is what we're going to talk about mostly here. And then there is also reflected uh, cross-site scripting, which is when um, someone clicks on a, um, a malicious link and then that script tries to run. But it, we're going to talk more specifically about the stored because that's what's going to go into your web server. The reflected, you don't really have control over that. That's educating your users not to click on dodgy links. Uh, you can still um, protect against it, but not in this bit here. So what happens is a hacker will find a vulnerability in your website. So that could be uh, if you allow comments on something. You have an input field, basically, where they can put text. So they'll put text in, and that will get saved back up to your server. So now you've got this malicious script. In your, in your server. Then your nice, friendly user will come along. You will serve them up this script. That script will run, and they'll possibly dish up their, their private information to the hacker, which was that one. I clicked over too quick. See, cookies going to the hacker, not good. Um, the OWASP, again, is really good uh, at getting you a whole load of ways that you can prevent XSS. So there's loads on there. But it boils down to input management. You don't trust your user. You don't trust anything that is inputted into your website. So you need to escape this text coming in. So taking out the chevrons so they can't have script tags. Basically stringify what's coming in so it can't run as a valid script tag. So that's the the main thing to escape everything, validate it, make sure it's coming from who you think it is and don't accept anything that you don't have control over. Uh, and then the final thing is sanitize that input. If you are taking uh, HTML tags and markdown or, or whatever, make sure that you're going through it and removing, say, script tags. Make sure that everything in there is as it should be. So start scrubbing out anything that you don't think belongs in a comment, for example. And then you can use the HTTP only cookie flag uh, on your requests. And that means that JavaScript can't access your cookie. It's only the server that can. So any malicious script that does get through, maybe on the reflected, so when someone clicks a dodgy link, JavaScript cannot access your cookie, so it's protected. So that's quite a good one to enable. Obviously, if you want JavaScript to access stuff in your cookie, that's going to be a problem and you'll disable it. So maybe you want to think about using local storage for non-important data. Say your client likes the dark theme. That doesn't need to be protected in a cookie. That can just be stored on the browser. Uh, so things like that, you just need to think about what you want on your cookie. <clears throat> cool. SQL injection. Now, you may roll your eyes thinking, oh, that's as old as the hills. No one's into SQL injection. That doesn't happen anymore. SQL injection attack number one on the OWASP top 10 application security risks of 2017. That's kind of two years ago now, but you get the point. It's not like 1997. It's 2017. This is still the number one method of attacking your sites. So just to clarify what is a SQL injection attack, it usually happens on the access point to your application, which is usually your login. So in this case, we're going to give a username, which is a valid email address. And then we're going to give the password, which is a SQL statement. So we've got a, a statement of truthiness, one equals one. And then we're going to look at 
finish that statement with the semicolon, and then we're on to the next statement. Now here, we're taking a guess that the user table is called users. So here we're going to drop star from users, and your whole user table is poof, gone. So that's how SQL injection attacks can work. If you are using Entity Framework, or some other ORM, uh, like nHibernate, or you're using Dapper, or you're even using stored procedures, you're going to be OK because you're parameterizing the input from the user. If you're using ADO.NET because it's super quick, you're, you're going to need to think about how you're dealing with the input that your users give you for search parameters or whatever. You don't want to put raw user input into your database. So you need to think about how you're going to do whatever you need to do to protect your database. Um, again, OWASP has a lot of information on how you can prevent SQL injection attacks. So if you think you might be vulnerable, go and have a look, and it will give you lots of tips. OK, so <coughs> if we have a look at C-Surf, at just a little bit of geekdom on my behalf, this is an ant infected with the cordyceps fungus. So any Last of Us fans in here? Yay! Oh, and another one. Yay! Um, so you'll, you'll know that the cordyceps virus uh, fungus turns the people it infects into zombies. So this is a zombie ant. It's been taken to the right place for the fungus to spore. Um, and that's how I think cross-site request forgery works in my head, okay? It might not in your head, but that's how it works in my head. So this is sort of phishing. Um, the hacker will send out an email with um, a, a link embedded into it, and this is wholly dependent on your user being logged in and authorized to the application you wish to attack. So I'm logged into my bank, I click on this dodgy email, and a script goes off to my bank and says, hey, why don't you send $100 or £100 to this hacker? And the bank goes, well, you're logged in, you're authorized, OK, and does it. So that's what cross-site request forgery is. Um, I think it, that's why it feels a little bit like a, a zombie in my head. But anyway, um, how do we prevent C-surf attacks? Good authentication methods are key. So we're looking at API keys or OAuth. Um, OAuth, uh, you, you've probably seen it. This is the login for or the sign up for uh, Stack Overflow. So you can use Google or Facebook to authenticate you for Stack Overflow. Now, as developers, this is awesome. I don't need to store your password or anything like that. I can say, hey, Google, is this person who they say they are? And Google goes, yes. And you're like, awesome, we'll proceed. So it takes a lot of that worry away from you as a developer. Now, some people don't like to use OAuth. I'm talking users. They'll be like, oh, but I really want to be registered. So sometimes you may have to, due to demand, store customer details and register themselves in addition to OAuth. So it can get complicated. Um, but if you can just use OAuth, it makes your life a lot easier. So it's pretty cool. Um, just as a point, if you are using uh, things like that, don't uh, store your credentials, your login credential. Don't use the same login credentials that you would on your UI, because just remember, the UI is accessible by JavaScript, and people can go and get it. So make sure you differentiate login if you have a, a website and you have an API. Make sure you're using different credentials, OK? So origin and or referrer headers. These are reserved uh, headers on your browser. So you can use these to say, hey, uh, I'm, I'm your origin, and then, hey, I'm expecting it to come from this referrer. So you can do some checks against that and make sure that your requests are coming from where you think they are. Um, it, it, it can really help because you'll be like, 
I'm not expecting it from, I don't know, this, this country, this IP address, this location, um, or that, that website. No, you just know. I'm not having it. Um, so only browsers can, cells can set these values for the headers. So it can't be attacked by um, JavaScript because they're protected. So uh, it's a really good defense against CSEF. Um, I haven't made a spelling mistake here. I refer it does have two, two R's here. It should be R-E-F-E-R-R-E-R. -E -R -R -E -R. But this was a mistake in the original documentation. So it has had to stay. So that misspelling, spelling mistake is, is there for the duration. Cool. Double submit method. So uh, this is where you will have something in the cookie and something in the parameter. This will uh, only work if you've got the HTTP only flag set so people can't fiddle with the cookie. And what will happen, it will come into the server and the server will go, do these two things match? If not, well, maybe this isn't coming from where I expect it to, and it will kick it back out. But as I say, it needs to work with the HTTP only flag. Similarly, the encrypted token pattern is where you'll have a, um, the username, possibly, a timestamp and a nonce, so some arbitrary value of your choosing. You'll make this token up and then you might either put the token in the uh, in a. Sometimes you split the token in half and put half in a cookie, half in a hidden field, or maybe you have the whole token in the in the hidden field or the whole token in the cookie. And what happens is when that comes in, your server will go. Does this match? Is this what I was expecting? Having the timestamp in there as well, you can put parameters as into when it's going to log out. So it stops that attack where people have just left themselves logged in because now that token is no longer valid an hour later if your timeout is after 20 minutes. So if you were using MVC on framework, do you remember on your controllers you used to have those uh, annotations of anti-forgery token? Do you remember those? That's how this works. So that would stick half in the cookie and half on a hidden field. And when it came back in, it would put them back together and then try and decrypt them. If it couldn't decrypt them, it would go something fishy on here and reject the request. Cool. And then again, that HTTP only flag a uh, cookie flag can be really beneficial uh, when you're trying to prevent against CSERF. So that was a lot of ideas about the attacks, but what are some further ideas that you can have to protect yourself? API management services. So most cloud service providers will offer you a premium service. Um, so this will handle security, monitoring, analysis, um, anything you want, really. comes at a price. I think when I last checked, Azure was £1,500 a month, so it's not cheap. But maybe your customer trust is worth that price. Or if your ap application you think is going to be prone to attack, then this could be really worthwhile to you. I know that the Azure one will take your existing application, it will build API endpoints on it, it will document it for you, so it's a very quick way of pro producing a, a profitable API endpoint, if you so wish. So if we have a look at the Azure site, monetize your data and services and open new channels to customers using Azure API management. So it will basically magic a whole profitable, remember, profitable API out of your existing application for a fee. Um, but they are really good at mitigating a lot of these um, things that I have just described. This one's a little bit odd, a little bit old school. Uh, IP whitelisting. So this may be if you are offering your API to a, a business, so more business to business rather than consumer. So you're going to sell your API service to a customer because you need to have a fixed IP, so you know what their IP is. And then you will have uh, that on your whitelist, uh, 
And the first thing you do when an, uh, API, um, a request comes in is go, is that from that IP? If it's not, kick it out. If it is, then you can go through your security. That is key. This is not a secure method on its own. It's an additional layer of um, security. IPs can be spoofed. Maybe you've handed out, I don't know, your API keys to someone dodgy. And that's where this might come in. You've lost your API keys. You publish them to GitHub. Um, and someone quickly comes in, but they're not coming from your whitelisted IP, so they get booted. So it's just an additional layer of security that's worth bearing in mind. Uh, I did work for a telecommunications company, not Twilio, a previous one, who used IP whitelisting as the way their, their VoIP calls came in. And I know that um, people used to, um, nefarious people, would add illegitimate IP addresses to the whitelist and then be done for £150,000 and things like that. So you need to be careful if this is your, your method of security. It needs to be layered in with other things. Okay. Um, so I want to touch on JSON Web Tokens, a.k.a. JWTs, or I have heard them pronounced JOTs. I, I'm, I'm not going with that. It's going to be JWTs, okay? Uh, you may often see these uh, referred to as bearer tokens. I know some helper libraries, it'll be a bearer token that you're going to create. Uh, it's all the sort of same thing. And they consist of three parts, the header, payload, and a signature. So in the header, it's going to state what algorithm you're using, HS256 in this case, and the type, which is a JWT. The payload, this is what you're interested in. Uh, you can put anything you like in here. This is all yours for the, the use. And then finally, the signature. So you have a secret to encode this, um, and it's combining uh, the algorithm and your data, and it spits it all out. Um, so I want you to be really mindful of what you put in the JWT and where you store it. So if you're storing this in local storage, remember that's going to be accessible. So if I just come out of here for a moment and take you to this cool site, jwt.io. Um, so you can put any JWT that you have. If you go and have a look in your your um, browser and grab some, you can come and drop them in here. Uh, and it will decode it for you. So here you can see I've got my payload. Um, you can put anything in there. So I had one that I've dropped in here. And if I can, and oh look, it's got password in there. So it's really worth noting that this is encoded and signed not encrypted. So there's a, a really big difference on that. So just be mindful of what you're um, putting in there. So just a note on load balancers when you're using certain like token uh, security techniques. Um, you need to have some thoughts on them. So a load balancer sits in front of instances of your application, and when there's load on your site, so users coming to your site, it will choose the server or the instance that is quietest. So here the load balancer is saying, well, server three only has one user at the moment, so I'm going to send this user off to that. If you're using tokens um, and you need other information, that's going to be with that server there. So if the user comes back and gives their token to another server, it might not know what's going on. It might. It depends how you program it, but it's worth bearing in mind. Um, so you may need to use server affinity. So you tell the load balancer, this user uses server three, and for all of their requests, they need to go back to server three or you need some additional data store or lookup table to enable you to uh, flip between all the instances of your application. Um, so we have covered 
so much there with API security. It was a, a little bit of a whirlwind through all the sort of major um, instances. I mean, this is a huge topic that you can spend your whole life rooting around in and finding solutions to. Um, this really was just scraping the surface of it. So notable mentions on there was obviously OWASP. Really go and have a look at that. Uh, ASP net core rate limit was that uh, NuGet package that I used uh, to do the rate limit um, by Stefan Proden. Really good documentation on that as well. Authy, if you want to know about implementing 2FA into your applications, um, you can come chat to me or uh, Marcos or Kevin on the Twilio booth, and we can tell you about that. Even if you don't want to use Authy, we'll be happy to chat to you about it. Um, and then if you're interested in reading the whole account of Nayuki's um, horrible extortion ordeal with his Twitter handle. I popped that on there. Um, I will publish these uh, slide, the slide to my uh, Twitter account. So if you're interested, you can go and have a look at there. All these links and everything will be there. I also have the, um, the project I demoed. Uh, that's on my GitHub as well. So uh, thank you. Uh, you can find me. You can email me, lporter at twilio.com. Uh, GitHub is Layla-P, so you can get that project on there. Uh, my Twitter is Layla Codes It, so you can also find me on there. Uh, or you can come say hi at the Twilio booth upstairs. We're, we're just about here. Um, but thank you very much for your time. I very much appreciate it. <laughs> if I can just ask you to... Do some feedback. That would be awesome as you leave either door. Uh, you can come chat to me if you have any questions. I'm happy.